right. Welcome to the second episode of Converse Cousins with Mike and Mark. I am your co-host, Mike Saltzman. And with me, as always, is my cousin, Mark Otten. I am. With you. <laughs> Not just in spirit. In, yes. real, in real life here, uh, visually and spiritually and literally. Yeah. Um, we will be discussing new topics uh, every couple of weeks, and we're together today for the second episode um, for how to fix your favorite sport. And our sport this week is college basketball. It's March, so perfect timing. And uh, we'll, ha- we'll have some rule changes uh, we want to see for the NCAA, some realistic, some extreme. Ultimately, um, we expect every one of these uh, suggestions to be immediately adopted by the NC2A. Yeah. Um, because that's the way we, we feel, and that's the way it's going to happen. I so. mean, we sh- we're in charge of the world, right? I think so. I, not not today, but I think by Tuesday. Mm, by okay. Tuesday, yeah. we'll be in charge. Just give it a few days. <clears throat> so, um, so let's get started. I, this uh, this uh, inspiration for doing the How to Fix Your Favorite Sport is your, your baby and your yeah. idea. So why don't you give us the first topic? Okay. Uh, well, so um, college basketball, by some accounts, is in... Uh, uh, is in disarray because of this, and, and it's because of these um, uh, players that are recruited by coaches uh, to basically play just one year, right. sometimes two, um, but that's considered not really the goal, I think. It, a lot of times it's one uh, year uh, to play for your school. Um, last night, my, uh, my, I'm a proud, um, where is it? Well, it's over here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a proud Matador, uh, Cal State Northridge. Our very own Mark Godfrey was implicated in the... <laughs> He's the basketball coach for a men's basketball coach for Cal State Northridge. Soon to be uh, was. <laughs> well, he may not last because yeah. he was named in a report. Uh, he was already rumored to be part of this. Um, uh, but when he was at North Carolina State, he recruited Dennis Smith Jr. as a one-and-done player um, and uh, may not have done so uh, without the piece of money uh, to, to help him out, uh, help uh, recruit the player, which is not uh, by the rules. So then again, the rules are kind of crazy. Um not allowing college players to be paid, um, and then also uh, just not really uh, education focused. Like it's right. it's all about um, getting these players in to then have a practice year before they they get drafted into the NBA, um, the highest level. So um, it's it doesn't really fit with um, college Edu- basketball or, education or, or education. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the concept of you know uh, coming to college and also taking classes and also playing a sport um, is just lost in all of this. And then the money issue is a big one. So um, I have a couple thoughts, but I will turn it over to you for your uh, thoughts on the solution. Well, I think part of it will be to remove this one and done rule of you need a minimum of one year of college before you can enter the NBA draft. Which I think is happening. It's, it's definitely getting back to that. I think once you've graduated high school, or even once you're of, of graduating high school age, once you turn 18, you should be allowed to become a professional athlete. And, you know, it, going our first episode uh, a few weeks ago was on the NFL. You know, I don't know how many 18-year-old kids would be prepared for the NFL, but there's nothing wrong with there being a pro football league that included 18-year-olds. In the same token, it's clearly um, proven and proven, whether it's, uh, Kevin Garnett and Moses Malone or uh, the LeBron James and Kobe Bryant, that there are plenty of people ready to play NBA basketball by 18. And whether it's <clears throat> another league, you know, LeVar Ball was all obviously very uh, infamous for trying to start his own league. Um, David West, a former Golden State Warrior and a New Orleans Hornet, among other places, um, is trying to start a, a pro league that will allow 18-year-olds to play um, the G League has 18-year-olds eligible to play, and you can go overseas um, even before 18 and play in different leagues there and get paid. Um, but 18-year-olds should be allowed to look for a profession once they once they leave high school, the same way any other profession. Um, you can become a professional at 18. Yeah, and, so, uh, so these, these kids, they come out, they're 18, they don't have money, a lot of them, right. and they also don't have interest in going to class. Right. So... So it's, it's, it's a slap in the face to the educational system. It's, uh, we're both teachers, and the idea that forcing kids to go to class for a year so they can become pros. And also that. not have money for a year. Right, exactly. That it's, there's too many things. So to me, the combination is you allow for 18-year-olds to make the choice of going straight to the NBA, and specifically in college basketball. 
And the other thing is that you give them some ability to make some money. Um, you know, paying the players a salary might go completely against you know, the idea of an amateur athlete. And I get that. And I understand that, you know, giving them money um, for playing seems excessive. But the other rules that are in place, some of the you know, ridiculous that you were kind of alluding to, well, one is, is that a, an athlete who is working, you know, 40 hours a week in the classroom, 40 hours a week on the uh, on the practice court, that they're not allowed to work. And if they can find time to work at a, a side job or make some extra money, they should be allowed to do that. And that money can go towards them being able to afford food on the weekends, be able to afford clothing so when they their body changes, they can actually afford clothes that fit. And, um, and then just be a, a high school and a college athlete. Like being a college athlete, you should be allowed to have some money in your pocket. And, uh, and whether you come for money or not, and um, – and so being able to have some rules set in, set in place so that athletes can do that. But if they don't want to go to college, there should be avenues for them to play professionally now. And, and so that's, and that, and that should be allowed to, whether it's the NBA or somewhere else. So in the old days, um, I remember, um, uh, John Wooden said, uh, that, uh, college athletes, college basketball players should be required to go to at least three years of college, uh, as part of their mm-hmm. uh, playing, um, and if they weren't prepared to go for three years, then they shouldn't go to college. <laughs> right? Seems kind of extreme. What do you think? Well, it's it's basically what the rules are for baseball mm-hmm. that you can be drafted right out of high school, but if you go to college, then you need to be there for three years. Um, I would be fine with there being a rule like that for. I mean, because football kind of has that rule because you need to be, um, re- you know, three years removed from high school to be eligible mm. for the NFL draft. Mm. <clears throat> and then baseball's, you know, if you if you go to a major college, then you aren't eligible for the draft for three years. So, um, you know, Bryce Harper, who got into the draft early, he graduated high school at 16, went to a community college for a year, and then was eligible because community college isn't part of that, right? So there are some ways around those kind of rules, and, and Bryce Harper's an outlier in that. Um, but I think... If the NCAA and the NBA wanted to put a rule together that if you go to college, then you aren't eligible for the draft for three years, I would be okay with that. It seems a little extreme because that there aren't really alternatives to – it's like 18 and you need to be LeBron good to make the NBA mm-hmm. or three years later. Mm-hmm. You know, There are plenty of guys who after their freshman or sophomore year are ready for the NBA. Yeah. So it does feel a little bit more extreme in basketball. But I'd be okay with that because it then would give some respect back to the classroom and respect yeah. back to the institution of the NCAA of what they're trying to do, which is build teams. Yeah. It would certainly be better for coaches because then they know if they get a player that that player is not going anywhere for a couple mm-hmm. of years. Now they could transfer to a community college. But they're and, not one and done. Right. And if they did want to be one and done in that, in that way, if they go to Duke and decide, you know, this isn't for me, I don't want to be here for two more years – they can transfer to community college and a year later be eligible for the draft. That you know that could also work too. So um, I'd be okay with that. I, I don't think it's necessary. I think just guys can be eligible for the draft after 18. But that rule makes way more sense than you have to be for there for a year. Because yeah. then, then what what that really means is guys are there for a few months, mm-hmm. and as soon as you know, as soon as it's April, they they stop going to classes and they start training for the NBA draft. And so what, it, that, what is even that, you know, yeah. are, they're not paying attention in school, their grades don't, they, when their grades come out, you know, we, I'm sure, we, I'm sure this happens way more than we realize, but, you know, whether it's North Carolina, who's been infamous for, you know, uh, changing grades, or other schools that just haven't been caught yet, um, you know, it's very possible that a lot of guys are eligible, you know, quote unquote, um, and no, don't really ever go to class. Yeah, it, there's something about the, the the latest rules too that it's sort of like what what the one and done rule has done is um, sent some of these players like Zion Williamson or whoever mm-hmm. sent them to college for a year when they probably wouldn't have done that otherwise, and so it's it's um, increasing the level of play of NCAA basketball, right? Like right. we're getting really good players. Well, that was the initial reason for implementing a one and done is so that the best players could go right. to college. So then. Right? So suppose they don't. So suppose that rule wasn't there. Suppose Zion just goes straight to the NBA, right, or plays a year in the G League or whatever it is. Right. Um, 
then Duke doesn't have him. Maybe they don't have R.J. Barrett or either, or you know, the next. Maybe they don't have five of their guys that they currently have <laughs> right, right. or more, right? Um, but they're still it's still Duke basketball. It's still got. I mean, it's still really fun to watch. Probably at that point, um, you know, Coach K is recruiting guys at that point then that are, you know, a balance more balanced um, package deal where they right. are wanting to go to college also. Um, maybe they're not even planning. Well, I mean, they're probably planning to try to go to the NBA regardless, but they're committing to more college. I guess what I'm saying is the the effort to get the best players to go to college to benefit college basketball and the level of basketball play it just d- doesn't make sense to me. Like it's still going to be really entertaining even if the 25 high school kids that want to go straight to the NBA don't go to college. That's just 25 guys, right? There's still going to be a lot of interest. Well, and it's it's top heavy guys. So I mean, Zion Williamson would not have gone to the NBA. It wasn't for this rule, and neither would have, you know, neither would Carmelo Anthony. And I mean, there's a lot of guys over the years that would have just gone straight to the NBA. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you know, the other thing too is, is that there they have rules in place that if you make yourself eligible for the draft, then you forfeit your um, your uh, amateur status, and then you can't go back to school. Then if you get picked in the second round, or you don't get picked, and mm-hmm. now you're done. Mm-hmm. Well, that. If, you know, transitioning to that rule as well, it's like let's eliminate that. That if you are in the draft and then don't like your draft status, similar to baseball, then you can not sign and go back to school or make it, you know, or go to school. It's like if a guy, you know, a top recruit at Stanford or USC gets drafted 25th and they thought they'd be drafted first, or they get drafted in the third round and they thought they'd be a first round pick. And in baseball, they can say, you know what, I'm going to go to college instead. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, the team that drafted that player gets that essentially that pick next year. Mm-hmm. So let's say the let's you know, you're a Kings fan. Let's say the Kings take a guy with the 10th pick, and he decides, you know what, I'm going to go back to Duke. Yeah. Then you get then he that, just doesn't want to be part of the Kings organization. <laughs> well, not so much Too anymore. Much losing. Not, not not so much anymore. But um, but so let's but let's just say that happens, right? Yeah. You know, or even the Warriors, like they're like, you know what, I'm not going to have playing time here. There's too many guys or whatever, and I don't want to go to the Warriors, um, or whatever team it is. Well, then there's no reason that player shouldn't be allowed to go back. And if you allow that, then that's a talented player you're allowing to play in college basketball. So that to go to your point of um, the, you know, kind of alluding to the reason that the one and done started, which was the let's keep the best players in college or get the best players to go to college, um, because we missed out on Kobe and LeBron and these different guys. Is that well? You also have a stupid rule that hurts. You know, the thirtieth best player who thought mm-hmm. he'd be good enough mm-hmm. for the NBA, and yeah. the NBA is like, you're going to be great, but not yet. Yeah. You know, M- M- Monte Ellis and Jermaine O'Neal, and there's some other guys that went straight from high school. They weren't phenoms right off the bat they were they took them a right. few years to get ready right. but a few years of nba practices got them probably as prepared as three or four years of college would have mm. um but that's the point they should be allowed to make those choices but if it backfires or if they decide that it's backfired and you know you monte ellis was a second round pick and say he decided i don't want to go to the warriors they're terrible you know especially then and so he's like you know what forget it i, I want to go back to, or i want to go to college well, then he should be allowed to do that because he hasn't done anything professionally yet, mm-hmm. you know. Right. And um, and allowing those players to go go to college after the draft would be good. And then you know, if, if to use that same example I used before, if the Kings had the tenth pick, they picked a guy, they decide I don't want to go to the Kings, then the Kings get the t- have the tenth pick the next year, mm-hmm. and that just gets sandwiched into the draft next year. So mm-hmm. if they had the twentieth pick, you know, the following year, they get the tenth and the twentieth pick, and then of the 30 teams, the 30th team now has a 31st pick, right? And then everyone just gets one less pick. But, um, but to me, that that would be a good balance for keeping the be- keeping as um, keeping better players in in college because you, there's no reason for that rule to be in place, and also allowing for more guys to um, to put their name in the hat for the draft. Yeah, I and that think- should be the case even if a guy's been in the college for a year or two. Mm-hmm. You know, if they make if they they declare for the draft, they don't like their pick. And they've been in college for two years. They should be able to go back for their two year deal. Yeah, I just think that it's not really college basketball. Like, okay, let's say let's take Kevin Love for example. Mm-hmm. Came to UCLA for one year. Right now they have this room at this um, beautiful new uh, 
basketball practice facility. I, I play tennis and I look up at this room. It's like there's got this row of windows and it's the Kevin Love like training center or something like that. Okay. Um, I'm thinking to myself, okay, he came to, to UCLA for one year. Like, I mean, yeah, go Bruins. Like he's a nice, you know, representative of the school in some ways because he's represented himself well. He's done come out recently for mental health issues and mm-hmm. things like that. Seems like a good guy, NBA champion, right? But like he was there for one year. Like, is that really celebrating UCLA education? Not really. It's more just like he decided to come for a year and then he decided to move on. Maybe he'll come back someday. I don't know. Uh, but is it, it is it called the Kevin Love Center because it's, they love Kevin Love or because he paid for that facility? That's an excellent question. Oh, okay, I don't know. I would ass- I would assume most colleges. I would assume they just they would kind of hold themselves out to the people that pay them money, yeah. right? Like, yeah. But I mean, if, I, when it, you know the facility is called the John Wooden facility, it's probably because they revere John Wooden. Yeah. yeah. Isn't necessarily because John Wooden gave them money because he's he meant so much to the school. I would think a Kevin Love training center would be. Because Kevin Love gave them some money. Yeah, it just seems like we should be celebrating as universities right. the, the the players that came for the university yeah. and not just as like a temporary training ground for the NBA. That was a that was an epic team, by the way. I mean, it was fun to watch. Yeah. Kevin Kevin Love, <laughs> Darren Russell, Collison. Russell Westbrook, Darren Collison, Drew yeah. Holiday, yeah. Uh, Mavute. Like, yeah. That was and that team. Let's was not forget about Lorenzo Mata Real. Okay, maybe we should go on. Yeah, I, I did forget about that. <laughs> I, I, I did remember all the NBA players they had, but I did, I did forget about that guy. Yeah. Um, Ryan Holland, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, so my my biggest thing, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people out there that say we should pay the players. And yeah. I don't disagree with that, although I do think if you, like, salary the players, that, that there's some ethic issues, some moral issues as far as, like, is this amateur sports or not? Because in reality, it's one of, you know, college football is more extreme of this, but it this is one of the greatest minor league systems mm-hmm. in sports is college basketball and college um, uh, football. And so let's not pretend that this has ever been about education, but there are colleges. There are a lot of people in these colleges that are going for an education and there still should be an education, you know, um, as a goal for all of these guys that, that go there. But my biggest thing about whether you pay the players or not is the extremes of when a guy gets hurt, a lot of times, you know, if it's not, you know, Zion Williamson is, you know, kind of infamous now for his shoe falling apart and now being hurt. And so many NBA players came out and said, see, this is why the one and done is stupid. This is why you should have let him go to the NBA. You know, if he gets hurt, it hurts his draft status, you know, and, and, and what are you doing to his future? He, he wants to be a professional athlete. He is good enough already to be a professional athlete. You are denying him that, right? So And, and his getting an education is so not part of that conversation. <laughs> right. And, you know, there's a lot of guys. I mean, um, the, the Warriors just did a thing for, uh, you know, the, the anniversary of the We Believe team from 2007. Um, they did a thing where they brought all the, all the players back because it's their last year in Oakland. And Jason Richardson mentioned that he went back to college to get his degree. Mm-hmm. And while he said that, Don Nelson, who's 78, was like, I went back when I was 71 and got my degree. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these guys get that education is valuable. And mm-hmm. usually it happens after college mm-hmm. right. where they realize once they're professionals, it's like, you know what? I do want to go back to school and well, finish my degree. And if I was good at what I was doing and I had a chance to go pro, then yeah. I would, I would well, and that's the it. thing. When someone's 19 and – and is so good at something they can get paid a very decent amount of money. And that, forget just the millions of dollars that's available in the NBA. If you if you can make a career at 18 of something you're so good at, you know whether it's you have a YouTube channel people follow, you know which you know obviously we're going to have thousands of, of subscribers soon. Hi everyone. Um, <laughs> but you know if this became a monetary thing for us, you know then and it, let's say it was more than your salary at uh, Cal State Northridge or my salary uh, teaching that then we maybe would consider doing this professionally, right? And if there was some kind of age restriction, it's like, no, you have to be at least, you know, 40, <laughs> and you're not 40 yet, you know, or whatever, to, to do it, it would be ridiculous, you know? Um, and so from that kind of supply-demand idea, it's like, no, if a guy can make the money, then he should be allowed to pursue it. Um, but my biggest thing is, is that there needs to be protection for not just the Zion Williamson's of the world that are going to go to the NBA eventually, but for the guys who aren't going to go to the NBA that are in college that did come from poor communities, 
that don't have any money and really don't have any options once they are done with college, that if they were to blow out their ACL or rip their shoulder apart or whatever, that if they were to get injured while playing, that they basically get sent home with their scholarship gone and that's it. And in reality, if nothing else, the bare minimum should be is that their medicals should be covered kind of for the rest of their life, but at least for as long as it takes to heal in any way whatsoever through that university. Because with how much money these universities make on major college basketball and football and how that drives... And the players specifically drive that income. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, when that's the case, then there absolutely needs to be some um, compensation for their medical to be basically covered, you know, for free. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that's the least they can do so that if I were to blow my ACL while playing for your school, that I don't have to go home limping, never get the surgery because you don't care about me anymore now because I'm useless to you because that is exploitive and that is inappropriate to me on all levels is that you should at least bare minimum help that person be, get, be able to get back on their feet literally. And with all the money that comes in, it wouldn't be that expensive to be able to help athletes recover, especially because most of these universities have their own medical facilities anyway. Yeah. So you know, they have, they'll have ways to help these athletes become, mm -hmm. you know, a hundred percent again. And that would be better for the school too, because if they got them healthy to a point where maybe they could play, play again, then there's no reason they you know couldn't do that. Or at least just help them finish their degree. Mm -hmm. Like they had promised them when they gave them the scholarship in the first place. Right. And there, the one thing I will say on behalf of the, the athletes in these situations is, uh, going back to the Kevin Love point that mm -hmm. I made, like, suppose this year, instead of going to Duke, Zion had decided to go to Cal State Northridge, right? Okay. Like, suddenly, everyone knows CSUN all of a sudden. Like, right. They're like, where was that? Like, like where in California? Yeah, is it and it's like, it's that? not CS North, like it says on ESPN. It's <laughs> CSUN, Cal State Northridge, you know? <laughs> um, so then suddenly, we would have all this attention that we've never had before. And it would just right. be because of one guy, basically. Right. In basketball, there's the kind of star power that you have. Uh, with one or maybe two guys, so so uh, these universities owe these 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 athletes a ton because they bring all this attention to the school, and right. especially in basketball, it's it's such a big deal. And um, you know, you might get an enrollment jump at CSUN in the following year just because of one guy, right? Um, or at least a lot of uh, recognition, a lot of um, uh, shirts being sold, and you know, a lot of attention. So um, anyway, I I think the athletes. In this case, the Zion Williamsons of the world are um, they, they they are owed a lot, uh, whether it's money or medical care or whatever, right. um, you know, or just being able to make their own decision. I'm hey, I'm going to go play pro basketball, you know, forget this college thing at least for now. I think I think they they are owed that, and they they deserve it because they worked hard and they're um, they're good at what they do. Well, I think to me those are the two things. Is the, f the first thing we're mentioning about medical is like if 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 you could get a four year scholarship. And it would allow you, and, and, and in that, you're allowed to work if you need to. You're allowed to have your medical, your, your medical is covered, whether you're healthy or not. And that if you get, if you get injured, that they will protect you. And if those things were, were in place, then it would be a much healthier environment for a guy who maybe is, you know, hiding or, you know, they're in injury because they're worried about losing their playing time. Mm -hmm. So they're playing on an injured foot because... They know if they tell them they're injured, then they might, you know, be sent home, or they might not play. Mm -hmm. And if they don't play, then they can't, you know, get to the league or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So, there, it's a from a health standpoint that would just create a healthier environment for all. The other thing is, and you just alluded to that, is that you know if CSUN had gotten Zion Williamson or, or any small school, that the amount of sales or a big school in, in, in <coughs> enrollment, but right. small in, in terms of um, success in athletics, right? Especially basketball, <clears throat> but just let's just use that. Even if even if it's Duke, you know, Duke is making a ton of money selling Zion Williamson jerseys that yeah. don't say Williamson on the back, but they have his number yeah. in their stores because that's the number they're choosing to sell because he's their number one player. Yeah. That's been happening for years, and that player receives no money for that sale. Yeah. Now, and again, we were talking about this, you know, uh, before we started, but to me. If you want to keep that money away from the athlete because they're an amateur athlete and you don't want them profiting off of sales of the school you know, merchandise or whatever um, while they're there, fine. 
I, I get to a point why that is. I but don't know if that's really fine. But okay. Well, I, I don't. I don't necessarily think so either. But it's like <laughs> my my point is a bigger point of like, okay, if you want to say that, okay, but that player still deserves something yeah. for that sale. Yeah. And to me, one way to do it, and it would be even a way actually probably for that player to make more Just money. to give them an A in the class. No, that's, that that's would be cheating. Almost. Never mind. I, it's close, but not Sorry, really. Sorry, <laughs> that, that's, 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 that's our That's already happening okay. at, at uh, North Carolina and other places. But, um, but is puts a percentage of that sale away for that player, and when that player graduates or when that player leaves your school, then they get that money. Um, and right. they have no problem with them getting that money in real time. And like, you know, you sell a hundred Zion Williamson jerseys and he gets, you know, maybe 10% of every sale. And then those, that money goes to into an account that he can use whenever he wants. Right. But if, you know, after four years at a school or one year at a school or six months, things that you sell with their likeness, things that you sell that are a hundred percent them, yeah. you know, if you sell a generic Duke shirt, you're, you don't have to give a percentage of that to the put to that you know to Zion Williamson. True, you, although theoretically, like if Zion had come to CSUN, there would be more CSUN shirts sold that year. Right, than and you know not. what? If you want to say the you know percentage of the percent hike, you know I'm not I'm not a math expert, but yeah. it's like if you say well, there's been a 300 uh, percent increase in CSUN yeah. you know merchandise sold since we signed you know this player to a to a scholarship, then give him a percentage of that 300% increase. You know, it's like, the, to me, again, maybe that player doesn't deserve, you know, all the profits, but they do deserve some of them. I like the idea of holding it in some sort of account, and then when they're done, they get access to that. that I, I think it's idea. a responsible thing to do and a smart thing to do. It make, it'll, The player will make more money because of it. They're less likely to spend it irresponsibly if they mm -hmm. are given it at 22 when they yeah. leave instead of 18. Yeah. Yeah. Um I would think we've seen enough examples in life of 18-year-olds being given millions of dollars and then becoming broke mm -hmm. that any any length of uh, delay would probably be smarter long term. Um, but even with that, the idea that you know you could sell a number 10 jersey and your best player is number 10 and that player doesn't get a dime. Yeah, it's like yeah. the only reason you picked that number was because of that player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the reason you're selling that specific jersey at that specific time. Give the players what they're deserved. All right, so uh, let's not an A in the class. Let's, uh, let's well, if they earn it. Let's shift to March Madness because that's okay. that's clearly the the you know the, that's the 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 golden goose. We have um, entered for, the madness. It is currently for, mad for the uh, for the for the sport. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things we we could talk about. What, what's what's something that you uh, uh, you just want to start with some with. format and uh, location of tournament games and uh, the the size of the tournament and all that stuff. Obviously, the um, the uh, NCAA tournament, the big dance, is um, I mean, is it the most popular sporting event, the most fun sporting event across all sports in the U.S. across the whole year? Probably is. What it, do you, think? I, I, you know, I, I would I mean, I assume you know, just from viewership, the Super Bowl is still number one. Um, you know, I think. You could probably put March Madness up with any pro sport as far as basketball, baseball, and hockey as far as like a, a seven-round, you know, a, a seven-game series mm -hmm. is probably getting just as much viewers as like the first couple of weeks of March Madness Yeah. Um, because everyone has a pool. Everyone has picks. You know, everyone loves to see a 15 seed or a 14 seed, you know, have a chance at the end. Um, everyone is – Trying to figure out what twelve seeds going to win this year because that always happens. It's and just a lot of fun. And yeah, it, it's 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 uh, it's something that um, that you know, if, of all of the different sporting events and um, tournaments and leagues and things, it's one that probably we shouldn't mess with. But right. I've decided to mess with it anyway. Well, we should. Um, we still should mess with it. So the the problem with it is not the the uh, the entertainment value and such. The problem is that for me. With 64, 68 teams, the best team is probably not going to win. Um, it, it, it's just, it's like, imagine the NBA playoffs and you have a bunch of game sevens in a row, right? Right. Like, you, you might get the best team winning, you might not. Um, uh, and so, I like, it depends on what we want here. If we want entertainment, if we want uh, something that's really fun to watch and there's a lot of pressure, 
um, and that gives the, the underdogs a decent chance, um, then we stick with what we have. If we want to actually crown the best team in the nation, the winner at the end of the year, then maybe we don't do this. Maybe we go back to series, or maybe we give the higher the higher seated teams, the the, the better seated teams, um, uh, some home court advantage uh, might be useful for them, um, because then they you know they have uh, better odds. They they may have earned those those uh, benefits you know over the regular season. So so I, I would say um, uh, some things like that, like maybe uh, go go to some series, or maybe go to um, you know, only the, the, the winners of the conference regular season, the, the winners of the regular season in conference play get to go to the tournament as opposed to the winners of the conference tournaments. Because the winners mm-hmm. of the conference tournaments, they may be hot at that moment, but they're not necessarily the best teams, right? Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, those, are, those are some thoughts. Well, we ta- we talked about this with our NFL podcast of, um, of how, you know, if, if the team with this best second half record you know, can maybe compete for a playoff spot and how that would in, in, increase some uh, in, entertainment plus also give teams that have struggled a chance. I mean, the, the conference tournaments give a team that went 500 in the conference play a chance to shock the world. Yeah, right? it's almost like the opposite of what we're talking about in the NFL because the NFL, it's like the regular season after a certain point for some teams is just pointless. Like, the, right. there's no... But well, and, in, college it basket, that, in college basketball, it would be too, right? It'd be pointless if you... If you weren't the best team, if you had already lost a few games, if you couldn't get to the tournament yeah. in yeah. any combat in any yeah. capacity because the team that wins the conference wins, then your games would become irrelevant, right? Right. So what we're trying to avoid here on both counts is irrelevant games. Right. You know what I mean? So like, let's say there's a conference tournament at the end of the year in the Big West Conference, right? There's, uh, I think it's eight out of nine teams make it. The last place team doesn't get to go, which is kind right. of funny. But anyway. Um, uh, suppose for that number six seed, probably Cal State Northridge, something like that. Like, you know, you play a regular season game coming up against uh, UC Irvine. You don't really have to win it. I mean, it's nice to win because you build right. a little momentum. But you're, you're not going to be the ninth seed, so you can. You're in yeah, the yeah. tournament either way. Right. You can still win the national championship, right? Even if you have a losing record <laughs> on the season. So some of those it regular can't happen. Games, it's, it's never happened, but right. it can theoretically. Which is, yeah. Which exactly. is kind of cool. Because it gives everyone a chance, right? It's very forgiving. Well, I think I think that's but, that's the best thing about Mar- that March Madness has going for it is that technically anyone could win on any given night, yeah, right? Yeah. We find I, I brought it up because I had for, actually forgotten the name of the school. I just knew they were the Golden Retrievers, but um, yeah. but UMBC yeah, was the first Maryland six, Baltimore County that's was the first 16 seed to ever win, and that became like the coolest story in yeah. a decade. Yeah. Of the of March Madness and maybe the coolest story in March Madness history. Like, does anyone outside of the schools that have one care who wins the national championship versus that 15 seed that won? Right when Santa Clara had Steve Nash and they beat Arizona mm-hmm. and they were a 15 seed beating a two seed. Like that Santa Clara has thought about that game for the rest of time, mm-hmm. as much as Arizona thinks about their national championship. You know. When they when when they had Mike Bibby and those guys, yeah. So, you know, March Madness can really create some unbelievable, you know, school moments. Whether you win yeah. one game or you win all six, you know, in the tournament. Yeah. And so, for everyone who's ever heard of you know, UMBC, I want to make sure I get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that you know they're always the going to golden re- retreat. Are they really the golden retrievers? They're the golden retrievers, okay. um, which is adorable, by the way. <laughs> but um, not very fearsome. I, well, it also perfect perfect mascot for a 16 seed, mm. but um, but it also it, it just proves that okay it can happen a yeah. one seed can go down because it never had happened before yeah. and so I think that's what's the most charming thing about March Madness is where who's going to get upset in the first round this year and then and then once that happens it's all right all right what what good team's going to end up winning yeah. right yeah. who's going to get to the final four and that's even a, a nice thing about the tournament is that. Going to the final four really matters, mm-hmm. which means that three teams that aren't going to win the championship get to feel like they accomplished something great. Mm-hmm. It's kind of it's kind of similar in bowls, not anymore because there's too many bowl games. But college football used to really matter if you got to a bowl because there was only so many, and so getting to a bowl game, even if you lost, was a huge accomplishment. And so to me, that's what getting to the Sweet Sixteen, you know, getting to that second week of the tournament. 
getting to the final four, it really does matter. And so for a 15 seed, a 13 seed, you know, all these, these, these uh, teams that are, you know, higher seeds or lower seeds, depending on how you want to say it, um, them winning two games is as big as most schools getting to the final four. And, and that you don't want to take that away. Yeah. Um, to your point about the conference tournament and, um, and the conference champion is, and this is something we talked about again before is what I think would be a good, good alternative is the conference champion gets by a buy through the tournament. Mm. And then you have, so like a perfect example would be the big West you just brought up. If there's nine teams, mm-hmm. Well, the top seed doesn't yeah. have to play in the tournament. Yeah. The one through nine, or the two through nine, become the one through eight. Mm-hmm. So there is no ninth, ninth place team. So mm-hmm. everyone gets to be in the tournament. Mm-hmm. Now the number two team plays the number nine. You know, mm-hmm. and then once the team that wins that conference tournament plays the conference champion yeah. for the right to go to the March to March Madness, yeah. and then you don't have um, you don't have a team who's sixteen and seventeen you know, shocking the world and going as the only representative yeah. um, for that school without at least having to go through the top team. So maybe we do the same thing with uh, the NCAA tournament and we give the number one seeds or the top four seeds in each region mm-hmm. a bye. I'm a, with the first round, I'm okay with that. You having, you know, because to me, right now it's what, 68 teams now? Mm-hmm. And there's four playing games, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that the four playing games, that's another, we get a little a side rule. The four playing games should be eight major conference teams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No mid major should have to play in yeah, the, I'm on board with that. Because yeah. now, now that they took away, they, they went, they went, they went away from just having two 16 seeds mm-hmm. play each other, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and now they're doing it more like a 10 seed, right? Which is like the the all bubble teams. Mm-hmm. And to me, and you know, maybe people that you know are at big conferences would have a problem with this, but to me, it's like you're a big conference. Your schedule is harder, so it's a lot easier to get in. If you're a St. Mary's and you're in the same conference as Gonzaga, you hardly ever go to the tournament because you go 25 and five every year, but you lost to Gonzaga <clears throat> as two of your five losses, and then you never get picked as a bubble team. So to me, the you know the, the idea that the, the bubble teams are then maybe Saint, a team like St. Mary's, it's like that's unfair to those mid-major teams that they don't even get a guarantee of the tournament. Like mm-hmm. give you know uh, uh, the schools. That you know, if if Duke was a bubble team, if you know uh, North Carolina was a bubble team, you know, then they shouldn't be given an automatic bid versus a St. Mary's because it's yeah, it, it happens every year. Duke gets to go all the time, so force them to have to challenge for it if they're a bubble team. And or you could have some immunity kind of clauses in there, like if you were the regular season conference champion in your conference, you can't be a play-in game. Or if you were right, a, exactly. Yeah, the, uh, to me, yeah, it champion. should. It should be all at-large teams, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and if there are a couple of mid-majors in there, it's not terrible. But I think there should be something to, if you're on the bubble and you're not sure between, you know, uh, you know Stanford and St. Mary's. Well, even though Stanford's the established school, it's like I'm I'm fine with them saying, you know what, St. Mary's, you get the automatic ten seed, and Stanford, you have to play to win, you know, mm-hmm. to get a ten seed mm-hmm. against, you know, Tennessee. Or Virginia or whoever. One thing that bothers me about these at-large bids is that it's so subjective. Um, right. Well, it's just kind of forced. To you're almost, you know, it's almost impossible not to be. You can, you can, you know, we've we've seen with like BCS and stuff that you can, you kind of can use numbers well, so, to yeah, so determine I mean, it, but it still comes from the rankings, which are subjective too. Right. So you'd have to come up with something in advance, like for example, uh, the ACC gets five teams, right? And if you're number six, then you're out. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, we have these conferences that get one automatic bid. Right. Well, maybe we, if we put a number on the other conferences, uh, something like that. Uh, I don't know how you would do that particularly fairly, well, though. And, well, that can be tough, too, because I, I would think there has to be some kind of a, a yearly, uh, like, line mm-hmm. that, like, maybe there's a, maybe if you get a certain, like, if you're in the ACC, then if you win, you know, I don't know what the number would be, that would be right, but let's say if you win 20 games. Mm-hmm. That year, um, or if you win 15 conference games, I don't know what the. I'm not exactly sure the right numbers, but just yeah. use simple yeah. math or whatever. But it's like yeah. if you get to 15 conference wins, you're automatically into the tournament, yeah. no matter it, how I think else. It have to be more like eight. Right, right, right. But I just mean like so. Let, let's just use eight then. But like if you get to eight, you're automatically in. If you're in, if you're in one of the major conferences, and if you get 
12, you're automatically in if you're you – know, so that that line yeah. then, you know, if there's six teams one year in the ACC and only four the next year, yeah. well, then there shouldn't be a number five because that fifth team isn't, isn't worthy of it or that sixth team isn't right. worthy of it um, at being an automatic bid. Or it could be a uh, some sort of other number like the previous year, how many teams made the second round of the tournament. Uh, from that conference, or no, well, that would be super interesting too because winning and losing the first round, um, that would incentivize schools, you know, even more to you know to win. And you know, it's like sometimes I think you know just getting to the tournaments enough, and as much as everyone wants to win that first round, it's like if you made some rules where you know winning going into the Sweet Sixteen or going into the Final Four helps or benefits that school or that mm-hmm. conference for the next couple of years and, mm-hmm. and how they're ranked. It's like mm-hmm. that to me would be there. It couldn't hurt. I don't think. Yeah. I, I, th- I like that for births in the tournament in terms of like actual seating. I don't mind it being uh, subjective so much because like you're in the tournament, you're, you've got a chance once you're in, right. um, but to actually exclude a team because they just weren't judged to be good enough on some like subjective criteria or by some statistical formula right. uh, doesn't make sense to me. So that, that would be one thing. Another thing um, that I, uh, wanted to put out there was just the, the neutral site games mm-hmm. um, that are play, like the conference tournaments, the NCAA tournament, all at neutral sites. Um, and I, I'm just not a big fan of neutral sites. Like, like okay, I, I understand that we want this to be fair, right, to both teams. Uh, we want it to be something where, you know, the best team wins. Well, we're already kind of not having the best team win. We might, but we might not uh, with the current system. Um, what we're going for is kind of this the excitement of a game seven, right? That kind of right. feel every single time, conference tournaments, NCAA tournament. So we might as well then put them on campus uh, at the different campuses, I mm-hmm. think, because, I mean, if you've watched a neutral site game, suppose you watch Duke playing a game in Charlotte, right, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, there's maybe a little bit bigger capacity of the arena or whatever, more a little bit more revenue probably. Um, but But, like, to watch that game, the fans are into it, but they're not, like, it's not that big a, like, when you're watching the game, you're like, oh, this is an exciting basketball game. Right. But if you watch it when it's on campus at Duke, and the fans are just right on top of it, you know, I mean, it's, like, amazing in terms of how intense it is. Right. And it gives the, the, the team, the home team, an advantage. So the, the home court advantage, I think, could be rewarded to schools that uh, earned it. So maybe the regular season um, uh, champion for a conference tournament. Right. Um, or well, and then and then the top eight seeds would have home games. And, yeah, would have home uh, home games. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that makes sense. I mean, they do that in um, the in the women's tournament in the NIT. Yeah, yeah, as well. So, um, I think they probably used to do that in the NCAA tournament, and then they're like, "Oh, we need to be more fair." And so then they pull I, out I wonder. I, I, you know, everything's always the, the rule changes are almost always money driven, and I wonder if it was getting was neutral if neutral sites had more to do with you know getting more fans to yeah. be able to attend the games. Cause you know, if you, if you have a first round tournament at, you know, um, eight, uh, you know, the SAP center, um, in, uh, in San Jose or something. Yeah. And now a city that doesn't have an NCAA team, but has an NBA size arena mm-hmm. can host a bunch of games. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not only getting like, you're not just, you're not just getting one game. You're getting like four. Right, so yeah. there's like four games, and they they play like back to back to back to back. Right? And sometimes they play the final four in like the uh, the Superdome or something. Like, you know, right, and you know, like the final four, it wouldn't make sense for it to be a home game. I think know. it'd be fun. I it, it, it would be it would be cool, but like logistically, if you wanted to have two games the same day, it's like some maybe there's something to having them, in, you know, having both games in the same place. But I also don't see that many capacity crowds mm. in these bigger stadiums. Mm-hmm. In those first couple of rounds, right. so if you want, if you want to have an atmosphere of what college yeah. basketball can be at its best, yeah. then playing a home game at Duke in the first round yeah. would definitely bring that. Now, yeah. you know, would the Golden Retrievers have won the first round game <laughs> if ninety percent of the crowd was the number one seeds? Well, in the so home that court? also goes toward my other point of rewarding the teams that did well to that point right. with the home court, because then. That makes sense because then they have a slightly better chance and of winning. To, to go to go back to your idea of like what would happen if Zion Williamson went to Northridge. Yeah. If Northridge had a season where they were a seven seed, yeah. How much better would that be for them if they got to have a home game yeah. in the tournament? That'd be amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. you know the other thing is it's logistically there's a lot of really small gyms. Mm-hmm. 
in some of these small schools. And so they would be kind of hilarious to mm-hmm. see a national broadcast game, yeah. you know, where you have all these reporters. But and then stuff. you get the revenue. And right, then, exactly. And then you yeah. build the bigger arena. I mean, that's what we're trying to do at CSUN is build a bigger arena. So you get you yeah. get a well, think about, season game. Think about if you're going from that point, how much better college basketball would look 10 years from now if you change the rule to the first two rounds um, you know, to get to the Sweet 16, you play home games, mm-hmm. and then the Sweet 16 goes on the road, kind of thing. Let's mm-hmm. say that was their, their new rule. Mm-hmm. So the first two rounds were home games. Well, if the Golden Retrievers get to have two home games, yeah. imagine what their facilities might look like a couple years, yeah. a couple years later, yeah. once that revenue gets added to yeah. having all those nationally televised games and having people come, you know, I, having, I to, think... having to stay in the community and all those, all the different yeah. things that come with you know, having a, a huge crowd of people come to your area. Yeah, and I would think a conference champion in one of those mid-major conferences would also um, be worthy of consideration for hosting those those first-round games. Like, if, let's say, UC Irvine wins the Big West, mm-hmm. uh, would they get a home game versus, like, the four, fifth-place team in the ACC, like, whatever, Georgia Tech? Like, you know, I mean, UC Irvine's probably not as good as the fifth-place team in the, SA, uh, right. in the ACC. But if they won their conference, maybe that's well, a and, nice reward. Yeah, that, and the thing is, is that, you know, if, let, let's just say UC Irvine went undefeated, right? Yeah. Then they would get a top eight seed mm-hmm. no matter who they played, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that, you know, if you, if you have a really strong team in a really small conference, yeah. it's not that hard to go undefeated. It's like Gonzaga, basically, right. has, has become. And, yeah. you know, Gonzaga had years where they were essentially undefeated. I mean, they only lost like one or two games. And when they do that, you know, if they if they had home games in the first two rounds all those years, their their facilities would probably be ten times better. Yeah. You know, considering just the, the instant amount of um, credibility and revenue and streaming and everything else. And just for the casual fan, I mean, it's just so much more fun to watch when these things are on campus. I mean, you, students get to go. And, you know, their the passion is there. The fans that that are most passionate get to go, as opposed to like right. let's say, you know, the ones that have money to travel or the Right, the, yeah, the yeah, non-students yeah. that just go because well, and, they you know, can't afford it. With the neutral sites, you see like two little slivers of the arena that are the the two teams. Yeah, yeah. and in you know if you if the home game was at Duke, then you'd see ninety percent blue and white, and then you'd have like a ten percent sliver of like the, the away team in their little section. Yeah, and that is a pretty amazing environment. Um, you know, yes. bring I've, I've brought up both Santa Clara and St. Mary's in this podcast. Um, but my best friend went to St. Mary's, so mm. a couple times already in our in our. Are lives. you saying that I'm not your best friend? Well, you're my cousin. So okay. You're family. Okay. So, Sorry. Yeah. It's Carry a whole, on. Diff- whole different level. Okay. But um, no, my best friend growing up though was went to St. Mary's, and mm. so we went to Santa Clara a couple times mm. and sat in the St. Mary's section to watch the games, mm. and mm-hmm. in what is a very you know muted version of like Duke, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Santa Clara versus St. Mary's matters. Mm-hmm. Those schools care deeply about winning those games because that's a yeah. rivalry. Yeah. And it's it's not the intensity of Duke, North Carolina, but it's the same idea, mm-hmm. right? And so to sit in a St. Mary's section and watch a, Saint, a Santa Clara, St. Mary's game and see St. Mary's do well, mm-hmm. it's a... You, I don't even have I have no feelings about St. Mary's, and you get caught up in the yeah, excitement. So yeah, yeah. just imagine how that'll feel to an audience yeah. watching on television, yeah. seeing you know St. Mary's fans go nuts because they're beating Santa Clara, yeah. but it's on a national scale. Yeah, let's try to find a way to get these these games back on the campuses. I'm on board. Well, and you know the it's one thing to have you know like the Superdome or the you know yeah. um, you know or something like that hold the national championship. Because that's kind of a cool experience too. It's like that scene in Hoosiers where they measure the back, measure the, the you know the distance to the free throw line, um, and measure the hoop to, to remind them that it's still a basketball court. That's true. You know, yeah, even though there's yeah. fifteen thousand fans instead of you know yeah, five hundred. I, I guess maybe you can keep the Final Four like that if you want, but I don't know. I'm I'm a big fan of keeping things on campus. Well, and it, it, I think it goes back to our general theme here of you know let's make student athletes actually students and athletes, mm-hmm. and part of the student athlete experience. Uh, Another friend of mine from high school went to Ohio State, yeah, and he's from Ohio, so he wanted to go there. But a big part of the reason he chose Ohio State was because he wanted to go to football games where there's a hundred thousand people in mm-hmm. the stands. Mm-hmm. And and to me, and we'll, we'll talk about this when we do college football. But one of the things for college football, one of the rule changes I wanted for college football is that the is that the um, 
the, there should be a 16 team tournament, I think. And that first game should be home games mm. for the teams of the higher seeds yeah. or lower seeds, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And so if, you know, if the first round game has to be at Alabama instead of the Hawaiian punch bowl, then, you know, that is even better for that school mm -hmm. and it's great revenue for the mid majors that make that tournament, yeah. you know? And yeah, so yeah, the yeah. same thing applies here. Yeah. I know central Florida wants that game, but we're going, <laughs> we're going off a different sport. Uh, all right. What else you got? Well, is, I, mean, I know for, for me, that there was some just some general stuff and most of it, the, the last few things I was just going to mention was just how there should be more opportunities for mid majors to be successful. Um, it's, it's what drives all the, 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 um, the Cinderella stories yeah. when any mid major can beat, um, you know, a powerhouse team. So, yeah. you know, if, if there's a, if there's two teams that are very similar, you know, we've used the same, we've used these same schools for a couple of their examples. So let's say Duke and North Carolina or Duke and, uh, St. Mary's have, you know, the same rating, you know, Duke's lost 10 games and St. Mary's has lost two and they're both possibly going to be six seeds. Well, then to me, then you make a priority of St. Mary's gets to play in the West bracket mm -hmm. and Duke plays wherever there's room mm -hmm. because Duke can travel. No problem. Their fans can travel. No problem. St. Yeah. Mary's, it's a little harder for people from Moraga to be able to go to the East coast, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and just to your point of let's keep things on campus, let's make it easier for the people on campus to attend mm -hmm. these games mm -hmm. and support their right. teams. Right. So the mid majors should be, so there should be priority in the smaller schools with less revenue, with less income, mm -hmm. with less funding to be able to play games closer to this home, is more whether the, they're on neutral sites or not. This is like a more on the realistic side of suggestions as opposed right. to mine, which are a little bit far fetched. But yeah, well, and I think a lot of things we're talking about is is really good to make the game healthier. But I, I also think it's like let's let's go back to just reality. Like you know, Duke has so many millions of dollars. You know, I don't mean to harp on Duke like they're the only big school. But it's like they're going to be fine no matter what their avenue is, whatever their path mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So as much as it would make sense for Duke to have a couple home games, you know, in the tournament for the reasons we just gave, if there aren't going to be on, if they're not going to be home games, then they their road games can be wherever and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas a smaller school, it's going to be a lot harder for them to travel. So to, mm -hmm. let's make it, you know, let's make it more likely that to happen. Another thing I was just going to say real quickly was just that trying to have more of a balanced schedule for mid-majors. I know there's a lot of preseason tournaments now where mid-majors get opportunities to play big schools. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the reasons that only one team from the Big West gets to go or um, or these other and, and these other, you know, smaller conferences is because they hardly ever play good schools mm -hmm. because right. most of their games are in the regular season, which means they only play schools in the Big West. Yeah. And then how many games they even get against a Stanford or a – Gonzaga or you know right. USC or UCLA, right. so you know putting some maybe not even a rule but just encouraging these these big schools to play smaller schools mm -hmm. more more often in the preseason because Duke and North Carolina and these other schools the other big schools they don't need a lot of tests early in the preseason mm -hmm. because games in the uh, early part of the college basketball season are completely irrelevant for those teams. Mm -hmm. Because if they win enough games in their in their conference, they're going to go to the tournament anyway. So a lot of those preseason games should be against mid majors that want to make the tournament. Mm -hmm. um, and sure. it, if there's more encouragement, because it's not like it doesn't happen, you know. But you know these body bag college football games where Alabama goes to some you know yeah. Alabama you know A and Q yeah. and beat them by eighty. It's well, like that doesn't yeah. help either school. Well, Long Beach State has done this with the with the with their non conference schedule in recent years a little bit. They've scheduled against North Carolina and they've scheduled right. against some teams and they usually get beat up pretty good. Right. You know, but at least they're trying, you know, that's the kind of thing that you're talking about. Right. At least they're giving them. Well, and, and there, and there should be more opportunities for tournaments where it's as many mid majors as, as there are, you know, uh, big, big schools, but also just, you know, get there to be more opportunities for mid majors to have some games because yeah. their games in the preseason matter way more. Yeah. Because if you're going to be saying, well, St. Mary's is an at-large team, they, they're 25-5, and five, and two of their losses are to Gonzaga, the other three are to major schools, mm -hmm. well, they probably would look better in their, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things if they were 25-5, and five, lost two games to Gonzaga, three games to, you know, Duke and North Carolina and, you know, uh, 
you know, UCLA or whatever, but then beat six or seven other teams that are in the tournament, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, if they're not given that opportunity and they only really get, you know, they're, if they're, if they're third, if the third best game they play is the the third best team in that conference, Mm -hmm. that's not helping them get to the tournament. Yeah. 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 I'm on board. Was there anything else you had or did we, did we fix all the problems? Uh, Well, at some point we need to talk about, uh, I mean, fixed them all but uh, okay so at some point in basketball ahead. in general we need to talk a little bit more about refereeing mm-hmm. um, and i think maybe i'll save most of that for our nba chat which can be soon you mean like not knowing what a charge and a block is or? just like every i mean the, the whole problem with basketball <laughs> <laughs> is the referees and it's not their fault necessarily it's just the, refereeing is an impossible job hard, yeah. that's impossible to do well even the best ones are criticized every game because they're clearly out for your favorite team. Yeah, and, and so that that, that that's we're going to preface our next episode with you know that where we do uh, NBA referee was that we're sorry refs. We we understand how bad it is for you at the same time we can do better. I don't understand why anyone would want to become a referee. I mean my my cousin Keith uh, uh, has done this. Maybe I'll ask him, but it's just it just seems impossible I mean, especially getting in getting berated by parents um, is probably really fun. <laughs> You know, it's, it's probably really exciting to be, you know, vilified as you walk to your car and, and hope that, the, you know, the parents don't follow you. I mean, it, I, I would think that would be exhilarating. I, uh, it seems unlikely. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think in, in college basketball, it's, um, it's, it's not so much of an issue as in pro basketball, just because in pro basketball, you have these superstar players that kind of command the, 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 the calls sometimes they, it yeah. seems like they get respect and then they get the call uh, so but then you have other players that are out there that are just complaining all the time i feel like the complaints in college basketball are a little bit fewer than you see in the nba in the nba it seems like it's constant. i think it's i think it just comes with the with the amount of um uh, you know what what a player thinks that they have as far as equity or whatever literal or figurative like mm-hmm. if you've built a relationship with all the referees over the years you feel like you have more leeway to say something, or if you just have a lot of money in your bank account and don't care if you get fined, yeah. you know, fifteen grand because you, you're making millions, yeah. then if you get fined for yelling at a referee, it's like whatever, I pocket change. It's not the best approach to handle handle other human beings. Yeah. But I think that's some of it. You know, college basketball. It's like if you start yelling at the refs every play, the coach will just pull you mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. deal with guys who are less confrontational. Which actually makes for me watching college ball like more fun sometimes because it's less belly aching about the referee <laughs> right. by both players and coaches. But then again, coaches complain too. That's like part of their and, job. And that, let's, let's establish that real quickly before we got here today. Re- the referees are berated by players a lot. The, the, the coaches are so much worse. Yeah, the coaches true. are so much worse. They're so much more consistent. Yeah. They ne- I mean, And college is way worse than pro. I mean, pro can be bad. I mean, Greg Popovich is you know infamous for – the way he'll yell at a referee, but at the same time, the college coaches are just, they go ballistic about mm-hmm. everything. And, and it's, and, and they have the same rationale that a Draymond Green or DeMarcus mm-hmm. Cousins has is that I'm making 5 million a year, so I can say whatever I want. Cause if I get fined, I have the money. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to, they're not going to shut up and they're going to yell at the ref the whole game because they, they because how, like how many times, like I mean, in the Bobby Knight, your players, in the know? Bobby Knight world of college basketball coaches, when has a, a coach ever been kicked out of a game? Like mm-hmm. Bobby Knight ha- happened a couple times, but mm-hmm. the extremes he had to go to to finally get tossed, it's like these these coaches basically, no matter what they say, they stay in the game. So mm-hmm. there's no incentive for them to be a normal mm-hmm. human being and say, "Excuse me, referee, but I think you got that one wrong." Yeah. Well, my my, uh, I mean, I guess we'll say stay tuned because I I feel like the human element of this referee. The, you got that wrong or you got that right the judgment it, it's just not really fair to the sport i feel like there's there's more we can do to, to uh, maybe enhance the referees abilities to until get, until we start right. talking about baseball and then we'll go to the real bottom so, okay yeah. yeah yeah but the human element will be uh, important in the next in the next episode yeah okay <laughs> yeah all right so thank you guys for joining us um tune us tune in the next time i don't think anybody's watching anymore anybody anyway, left i you know i mean if Hello. you're if you're if you're still here, thank you for being still here. I mean, it's it's been a while, so thank you so much. Um, but we'll be back in a few weeks, and we'll be t- we'll go NBA next. Uh, we're talking about perhaps that might be.
the best. I mean, time we're getting we're getting too close to the NBA playoffs, so it's gonna be good time. I want to put it on record. Uh, let's see, who do you predict to win the NBA or the uh, NCAA championship this year? Who's your team? Um, well, I, I think we 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 talked about them so much that it would be kind of rude not to. So I'll go with Duke. Okay, uh, I'm gonna say Cal State Northridge. <laughs> They're gonna win eleven, no, thirteen games in a row to win the double. No, uh. Let's say I'm gonna say not Duke. I'm gonna go. We'll go Gonzaga. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Hey, if Gonzaga wins more to him. If, with all the the talk I had earlier about mid majors, that would be the greatest thing to see <laughs> a, a mid major win the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll, ri- I'll ride or die with a, a healthy Zion Williamson in a few weeks. Okay. All right. So till next time.